Hi, everyone. I'm Alaris Rajagopal, Senior Editor, CGT. And like many of you at home, I'm hunkered down in order to help with social distancing as the coronavirus continues to unfold around the world. So while we're all stuck at home, I've enlisted the help of a panel today to help consumer goods companies and retailers figure out how they can help. Um, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to Doug Rammel, and he'll introduce himself and the rest of our expert panel. So go ahead, Doug. Uh, thanks, Alaris. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Doug Rammel. Um, many of you know me from Suavecito Tequila. Um, I'm actually uh, a venture capitalist for those of you who don't know me. Um, but one of my investments actually is in uh, monofoil, an antimicrobial product that obviously is, is a is uh, in big demand right now. But um, what we're going to talk today is part of the Curb the Panic series is what can um, retail, CPG, and other companies and executives do to help. And we have a really distinguished panel that we'd like to introduce um, in just a second. But if go ahead and hit the next slide, Alarise. I, I want to be clear about what this is, meaning what is this, what's the purpose of this webinar? Um, we're really trying to do a pragmatic discussion of current events and real world ideas and solutions. We want this to be obviously as fact and as, as factual as we can make it and certainly perception based. Um, th this isn't a political discussion. We're, this is, we're not going to try to solve how did we get here. There's plenty of other venues that can have that conversation. What we're really going to try to focus on is what do we need to do now. Um, I want to stress that we all are in this together, and I think you're going to hear from each of the, our panelists that same message, but there are specific things that each of us can do, and ultimately, this is, this is really becoming a new normal. Um, and so, you know, as we try to return to business, I think we're going to find that business as we used to experience it is going to be quite different. Uh, the next slide, Alaris. What this, um, what do we face? I mean, I, you know, there's plenty of places that you can get more factual information on COVID-19. It is a respiratory infection, basically similar to pneumonia caused by the SARS-CoV-2 virus, impacts the lungs and other systems. It was originally an airborne virus. Um, it's considered very virulent and it's especially infectious. It's transferred through respiratory droplet contact. So that you know that's the that's the that's the, um, the enemy that we face. But what is it? What is it caused? And if you could go to the next slide, Alaris. You know, ninety percent of the U.S. population is now under some sort of home protection order. There's obviously been rec record unemployment, layoffs, and furloughs. The economy is contracting, and ultimately, all of our technology and operational processes and systems are under stress. I know one of the facts that was shared in one of the first curb the panic um, sessions is basically companies that are continuing to operate are seeing anywhere in the neighborhood of 30% absenteeism. Now, they don't know if that's people that have actually been affected by COVID. Those are folks who just aren't going to come back to work. Um, so there's some very practical and real challenges that we're facing in trying to remote working, um, you know, and, and access, dealing with new technologies, Obviously, the whole operational safety and hazard policies piece, the risk management piece, and staffing. So um, the next slide there, Alaris. Our panel today, um, I've already explained who I am, Doug Rammel, um, formerly uh, ops and tech exec in the healthcare and sporting goods, um, now venture capitalist in a bunch, in a bunch of other different things. Um, uh, Sally Mason uh, Bamer is the CFO for Mass General. Um, Dean Smith is the, our public health panelist. And then Daryl Brewster is our industry panelist. But I'm going to allow each of them to kind of introduce themselves. So, um, Daryl, you want to go first? Yeah, thanks, Doug. Uh, and I'm honored to be part of this panel and to be talking with so many people during this real important time for us in the history of this nation and, uh, and around the world. Uh, I am the CEO of CECP, Chief Executives for Corporate Purpose. And we work with well over 200 of the world's largest companies, including many that you all uh, work with, to really encourage them to be a force for good in society. I'm a former CEO, both in the CPG industry as well as at retail. So I can kind of bring a perspective of both of those industries to this space. And again, honored to be on a panel with people on the front line like Sally and, and Dean. And, and thanks, Doug, for pulling this together. Hi, I'm Sally Mason Bamber. So in my day job, I'm the Senior Vice President for Administration and Finance at Mass General. That means I have all the non-clinical functions of the hospital, including CFO. 
But today I'd say my job is really, I'm part of the hospital incident command center. We're operating in a incident command structure. So in that structure, I'm the logistics chief and the finance chief on certain days, trying to help us navigate through this incident. Um, so day-to-day uh, -day life has changed, I'd say, dramatically. We truly are operating in command st center structure. So every we meet at 8 a.m. and 3 p.m. every day. We are organizing what our goals and objectives are for that day and, and frankly, doing a lot of planning of looking ahead, predictive models of what the surge might look like and, and how do we uh, anticipate what it's going to be, what supplies we need, what uh, labor pool we need to be able to serve that growing demand. What what are you seeing? I mean, what is have you have you guys seen a surge yet? Is it are you is it something you're expecting? No, we have. We are up to about 250 inpatients right now, and I would say a significant level of acuity. Um, early weeks, uh, we're definitely focused on the outpatient and testing process, how to bring people in, uh, get them the testing, or or deal with mild uh, acute respiratory uh, symptoms. These days, it, it definitely is an inpatient and ICU focused um, and planning for that surge. So that's how we've seen it shift over time. Um, we are expecting, our models are saying we should probably peak between like the 16th and the 19th of April. And we've seen pretty much what you've heard nationally, you know, doubling about every three days or so. Okay. Um, Daryl, what's what's changed in terms of your daily life? What have you seen in the operations of CEC, you know, CECP? And then what kind of requests and things have you gotten from your members? Sure. Uh, great question, Doug. We're, we're clearly seeing an impact here that has been both fast and vast. So virtually every job has changed for people across the uh, across the, uh, the nation, our, our 200 plus companies. Uh, companies that are in the midst of this, healthcare companies like it, or Mass General, uh, those who are making food products, toilet tissue, these people are working round the clock trying to keep up with demand, logistics folks. On the other hand, certain industries like travel, restaurants, sit down restaurants and others literally have no demand. So all companies have, but all companies had an impact on this. The differences are really immense. And we're fielding daily dozens, scores of questions coming in from companies asking what others are doing, where they can be helpful, where they can be supportive. And then what we're working is convening companies around topics by industry, by issue, by geography, to have discussions and conversations about what they're doing to get ready, what they can learn from others. Many people just want to be heard. What are they doing? So we can really share best practices. We've seen things like this, but not everything like this before. And the fact that it's a global basis is, is remarkable as well. We have country partners around the world. We were on the call last week with our partners from Italy, which is a few weeks ahead of us and going through some difficult times. And I mean, the stories there are, are heartbreaking. It's stuff I think hopefully we can do a, a bit better job of that. But it's really understanding that information and being able to distill and curate that and communicate it back to companies so they can be ever more effective in their efforts. And then to encourage them to truly be a force for good, to be purpose-driven leadership at this time. Uh, my name is Dean Smith. I'm Dean of the School of Public Health uh, at LSU Health Science Center in New Orleans. Um, we're a comprehensive health science center. We have a medical school, nursing, allied health, uh, as well as public health. Um, New Orleans is really in a crisis stage for COVID-19. Uh, we have 9,000 cases in the state, uh, 300 deaths, and two-thirds of those are in the greater New Orleans area. Um, our medical center, nursing school are all hands on deck. Everyone is uh, tapped in working in the hospitals, the clinics, um, doing telemedicine work and staffing uh, a series of tents outside screening people as they go through. Um, in the school of public health, we're responsible for modeling of the crisis in the state and locally. Um, we have students engaged in almost every part of the public health department, uh, which is really strapped itself. Um, public health is one of those areas that when there's nothing happening, uh, we think it's a terrible waste of an investment. When a crisis happens, why aren't there twice as many of these people involved? So that's where I'm at. Gotcha. Well, obviously, we very much appreciate the work you're doing and 
and obviously the challenges that you guys are facing um, on the front lines. So, Dean, why don't, why don't we have you? Why don't you go ahead and speak to what help you need? What are things that other people could do for you? Um, are you getting donations? Are you getting volunteers, et cetera, et cetera? Um, so New Orleans is an area that uh, 15 years ago had a bit of a crisis that people probably heard about, Hurricane Katrina. Uh, and uh, ironically, prior to the start of this crisis, uh, the School of Public Health at LSU and Tulane University uh, across the street are working on a special issue of what lessons we've learned from Hurricane Katrina for the American Journal of Public Health and a September uh, symposium about this. There's a strong volunteer community in Louisiana. A couple of years ago when Hurricane had a flood, the Cajun Navy went over to, to help them. So we have five websites across the state, including one by the Department of Health that allows people to sign in, indicate what their skills are, and allow people from the Office of Public Health, the Department of Health to tap in to, to pull people into it. So we have a number of people who are willing and able to volunteer. Uh, a challenge, of course, is that not everyone has the skills that would be, be required. Um, uh, on, the, on the nursing and medical school side, we have a lot of third year, fourth year students that want to help, not quite licensed yet, uh, we're, we're working on that. Uh, on the public health side is we're doing active tracing, uh, of monitoring, of doing the connections between all of the healthcare facilities from hospitals, nursing homes, clinics, FQHCs around the state. There's some education that's required and some people are just too busy to be able to handle the volunteers to bring them on board. Uh, on the supply side, um, I, I work closely with uh, the medical school and the, and the health system. Um, and I think we're in the same position as a lot of other provider-based organizations. Um, there are supplies here today. Uh, we see that there are going to be enough for the next several days, perhaps next Wednesday. Um, and then it becomes questionable. Um, it's a competitive marketplace out there to get protective uh, equipment. Um, and the city of New Orleans, the various health organizations from Oshner Health System, uh, uh, Children's, the University Medical Center are trying to work together and are doing a good job of communicating who's got what and, and trying to distribute the supplies and the equipment. Um, but, but we can see that there's a, a limit to it. Uh, and the question is, will Louisiana be more competitive than Mississippi or Texas or someone else in getting the scarce supplies that are being sent here? Hey, Daryl, could you talk a little bit about some of the industry coordination that's going on trying to pull together supply chains as well as trying to supply voluntary donations and those kinds of things? Sure. No, great, great, Doug. And yeah, I think this was an effort that really came off a standing start, as, as Dean said. You know, we, we were not always as prepared as I think we would have loved to have been, but we are where we are, and we're seeing companies step up in a lot of ways. I think in terms of things along the lines of just awareness, we're seeing the Council of Advertisers uh, and National Advertisers really putting messages out there, including the news, to just really help people on the social distancing and other areas. Uh, on t testing, uh, the test from Abbott looks to be a, a successful one, and uh, to the degree that can really work can be really helpful. People like Quest Diagnostics and BD are working on getting those test kits out and completing those tests in a faster way. Uh, you know, pp and &E is, is a, a big effort for all, and it's just been encouraging to see a number of companies like Haynes Brands or Estee Lauder uh, to really convert their lines to be able to make the, the gear and kit that's really needed today. That's happening in, in really incredible time, even on the testing. Tests that were taking years of getting approval are now having happening in a matter of, of, of weeks uh, on that. Uh, and then, of course, on the medicine side, uh, efforts with people like uh, uh, Regeneron and Sanofi with, with what may be some, some medicines that can be very helpful and fast-tracking those. Uh, certainly uh, lots of work happening on the vaccine side. And then even facilities where logistics companies, uh, company Limbach Engineering is really helping convert hotels, which have very low occupancy these days, into hospitals, uh, which are going to have very high in certain areas. So it's really interesting to see different companies collaborating and working together to address those specific issues across the supply chain. 
Hey, Sally, why don't you talk a little bit about some of the specific efforts that you're in charge of at Mass General, trying to coordinate both the traditional supply chain and then obviously all of this um, community effort. Thanks, and I think it'll be a nice segue from Daryl's comments, actually. So what we discovered early on in this incident is we were actually overwhelmed with offers to help, and that's what we called it broadly, offers to help, because they were either people trying to connect us with more established distributors of how we might get PPE, or uh, innovators who are looking to uh, design or retool what they do to help healthcare workers, or um, employee appreciation, whether it was food or donations to encourage and help our staff. So we instantly realized we need to set up an organized portal for this because we were being overwhelmed. So we set up an electronic web uh, to be the whole input. I've got seven people working on it per day to help us just sort through how to find the biggest and best opportunities that we can leverage of our scale to thank and acknowledge all those partners who have come forward, but also sometimes to redirect them. So if they're not of a scale, perhaps Mass General, they could help nursing homes in Massachusetts. So we've been trying to sometimes be um, able to take them in and pass them off to another organization in need. So our biggest challenge was being overwhelmed uh, with the offers to help, getting that infrastructure set up, um, and getting it in here again, both to either recognize our, our staff or to keep them safe in the work they do. And, and the innovative space is really what's just so exciting, whether it's 3D production of the N95 masks or reprocessing masks, um, just some really good stuff I think is gonna come out of this that'll help the future of healthcare. Great. I mean, it, 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 it's, it's ironic that it unfortunately sometimes takes something on this kind of scale to really help us see what America is capable of doing when, when really challenged, right? Um, and I think my guess is, is that most of the other, most of the people listening to this conversation or watching this conversation on the web are all interested and eager to do whatever they can do in their local community. So what I guess I'll do, Dean, let's have you go first. Just talk a little bit about what you know, two or three things would you recommend to anyone, regardless of where they're sitting in the country, that they can do to help out in this crisis? Well, the first thing that everyone can do um, is to find ways for their employees and others to work remotely. Um, we have uh, the, our biggest concern here is, is about spread number of cases we need to as as the professionals say flatten the the curve um and we have too many people on the streets now uh, this is new orleans and um you know people are used to being outside and playing um what we need from uh, the business community is is find ways for people to stay in their lane, like do what they do, but do it efficiently and, and remotely. Uh, relating to what, uh, what Sally said, we have the uh, hotels in here have stepped up. We have a large homeless population in New Orleans, uh, many of whom are now at the Hilton Garden Inn. It would otherwise be empty. Um, and now they're off the street. They're not spreading. They're, um, uh, it may maybe have helped their life. We have some other hotels that are working as uh, short-term, long-term care facilities. When someone is discharged from a long-term care facility to a hospital because of an issue, they can't go back to the long-term care facility. Those are a, a real hotspot. So uh, now they're at some of our nicer hotels in town. We have the food community has stepped up to help first responders and others uh, in a time of crisis. Um, and a lot of businesses have chipped in to help that. Yeah, logistics of getting meals uh, uh, to families who, who shouldn't be leaving, to first responders who can't leave. Um, uh, but, uh, but we're a service-oriented town, so we can handle on the service side. Um, on the product side, we have some distillers that now make hand sanitizer. Um, and uh, I think there's probably a lot that every company can do if they can find a way to coordinate and find out how they can fit in. Actually, Daryl, why don't you talk a little bit about you know, the approach that um, CECP has been doing with your members and particularly the whole stakeholder approach? 
Yeah, now what we're really encouraging companies, and I like uh, the comments from, from, from Dean, Dean, um, about companies who have largely moved to remote, staying in the lane and using what your resources are to have a positive impact here as we move forward. Not everybody can do everything. Let's get that coordinated to move, move forward. We're really seeing companies think about this along a series of stakeholders. One is their customer base, and that really determines whether they're really running uh, way over time or whether they have no demand at all. So if you're in the travel industry, as we mentioned right now, you're struggling, but we are seeing some innovative things like hotels becoming hospitals. At the same time, if you're making uh, you know, PPE or toilet tissue you're running or soups and certain products you're running around the clock. So that's really been a big separation. We're seeing a lot of work happening on the supply chain uh, to keep the rest of the economy going as well as, as, as our first uh, uh, people in the front lines on those are key. Three areas that we're really intrigued by that also companies are stepping up is how do you now deal with your employees? Recognizing they're in very, very different situations. Uh, CEO of, of Marriott, which is, is, is struggling. They've had significant layoffs. But he and senior executives have gone to no pay. They are providing furlough and support for those. I'm on the board of a company. We just increased the wages, of, which is making food products. We've increased the wages of our frontline workers, our factory workers, by 50%. So they can have a real incentive to go to work, to continue to be part of the, the solution here that we're going forward. But addressing employee needs, we think, is critical. Again, having people working remote, um, something I think we're going to see a real continued growth in that here as, as we go forward. The other area is community and how companies can really step up. Sometimes it may be with specific resources, skills, capabilities, and people. Other times it may be money. And I, I will say in this occasion, the banks, um, which I think we as a society helped out last time, are stepping up this time. Uh, the dollars we're getting are well over a billion dollars. The companies have now uh, are, are investing in uh, COVID. Companies like a Pepsi, companies like Wells Fargo, uh, J.P. Morgan, Mastercard. All of those and many more have really stepped up with funding that's going to be so crucial for us now. And as we get into phase two of recovery and phase three of you know, prevention and prevention for 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 the future, um, all those are areas where we're seeing companies uh, find new ways to step up. Uh, and of course, the other is working with the uh, the, the capital markets. Um, and how do you now deal with that in a in a in a market? Certainly, creditors are key. Got to keep the cash going. So far, that has been uh, has worked out well. Uh, but the market's going through some some real change, and uh, that's that's an area right now. I think companies are much more focused on getting a solution here and getting recovery uh, than trying to manage uh, quarterly earnings, which I think is a good good thing for now and for the future. Hey, Daryl, actually talk specifically about that management of cash and particularly for small businesses versus larger businesses. Uh, you know, one of the things you guys have suggested is that a larger business that might have a stock, uh, might have excess cash, could prepay smaller businesses and suppliers as a way of trying to protect people. Yeah, having you know lived through and been a CEO during some turnaround situations, Cash is really king. I mean, it's so important to be able to have that to operate. The credit markets have been good thus far, and we are seeing companies like Pepsi step up and accelerate payments to businesses that are out there. Uh, we're seeing individuals step up and you know, bigger tips to people who are delivering products that are coming into the, to the home since they're, they're not going to, to restaurants uh, and really being supportive of those who are really on the front line, not so much in the healthcare side, but in kind of keeping the system operating and, and, and moving as well. Uh, we're also seeing companies that are uh, you know, really making sure they have enough cash in their credit line and others. And then a number of the acts from the, uh, the, the, the two, uh, the CARES Act. Uh, over $2 trillion of our money for the future is still a little complicated, uh, but the uh, SBA 7A clause really allows companies, uh, which today it's it's due around these days, but allows companies to get a loan which can be forgivable So uh, over a couple of months so that they can continue to operate and encouraging you know people to apply. I think that's going to be oversubscribed, uh, and the banks are wrestling through that, but, but it's efforts like that that can really help also, a lot of efforts that are happening at a community level. And I'm sure that sounds like it's happening in New Orleans, in Boston, where people are getting together to support uh, locals. Because, again, the local governments, business is where the resources are that help to support those. So we're seeing lots of actions on in those specific areas to kind of keep this economy going now and help on a speedier recovery once we get past the, the, the peak and have the, the health situation in better shape. Okay. It's Sally, talk, talk specifically about in Boston. I know you guys are getting a ton of donations from companies like New Balance and 
Reebok and others that are good corporate citizens, but how can they best work with Mass General? So I would say two things for companies. One is your platform with your employees, reminding them of social distancing, reminding them there are ways to help uh, in their own communities, whether it's uh, donating funds, donating blood, or, or keeping those supplies in the local small organizations. I think for the big corporations, um, I do think there's unique partnerships they can do with hospitals. And, and so I guess I would say, be patient in trying to get through to us because we've made some really unique connections, people who are willing to turn their operations into scrubs. A uh, neighborhood uh, of ours where they've given us their parking spaces, they're obviously not being used. It, it was a huge morale boost to our employees that we can allow everyone to park because those spaces were donated to us from neighbor businesses. So um, I, I'd say be patient, think of areas of overlap, again, foods, products, or services, um, and, and try to make those connections with your hospitals. Okay. Hey, Alarise, pull up the last slide. Um, and just in terms of wrap up, um, what we want to, what, and what we'll be publishing along with this webinar is basically the, a, a number of, of what we're calling references or resources. So this is specifically, I would encourage everyone to go to the U.S. Center for Disease Control, the World Health Organization. Um, sometimes I think we forget about our state, county, city, and local health departments. All of them are fully engaged. I think, Dean, it was your comment that you know, we all kind of forget about public health until it's really needed. Um, clearly those folks are, are doing yeoman's work, but they're literally activating plans. They're making decisions on a day-to-day -day basis that can impact how your company runs and how your company can help. Um, and then there's a number of equipment donation coordination sites. There's a number of philanthropic and financial donation sites. There's too many of them for us to list here we will get them out on the website. And obviously anything that, that each of you have, um, whether it be LSU specific or Mass General specific, or Daryl, anything from your organization that you want us to link to, we'll be happy to put on um, on the central repository and we can kind of go from there. So um, in terms of wrap up, I just want to thank everybody for participating. I realize that everyone's busy right now and, and, and particularly for the two of you that are on the front lines. Um, really appreciate the work that you're doing. I know that our thoughts are with you and um, we're going to get through this together. Thanks, Doug. Thank you, Doug. Thanks, Thanks guys. Thanks, Ellery. Thank you so much.